Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the uh, the fourth laboratory session for GGS 300. So I hope you're able to download this code and uh, actually open it up on your machine and then basically run through what I'm going to show you today uh, in kind of in tandem with uh, what was essentially inside the previous lecture where we kind of showed quite a few of the different equations that we're going to have to use in order to answer various different probability questions. Okay, so without much further ado, let's let's get stuck into this lab. So essentially, we're going to do a little bit of uh, calculation for some basic probabilities first. So, so you'll remember within the uh, actual lecture slides, uh, we focused on these uh, these three different types of uh, probability outcomes. So let me just try and find them just here. Um, yeah, the rules of probability. Um, so where are we? Here we go, statistically independent events, mutually exclusive events, non-mutually exclusive events, okay? So here's a question, so consider this problem. Every person in the world has a blood type and that falls into one of a variety of different uh, blood classes. Okay, so A, B, O, or A, B. And in the US, the distribution is broadly about 45% of people have an O blood type, 40% of people have an A blood type, 11% of people have a B blood type, and about 4% of people have an AB blood type. Now, any person can receive their own blood type or the O blood type, okay? So the question is, what's the probability uh, that a randomly chosen American can actually donate blood to a person with the type B uh, blood type, okay? So what we want to do is we want to find uh, the type uh, probability for type B, and we know that that's going to be 11%, and the probability for type O, which we know is going to be um, 45%. Okay, um, so the probability that any American, therefore, is going to be able to actually donate this blood type is going to uh, essentially be the probability of B plus the probability of O. Okay, so remember that the key point here is that um, what we're basically saying is uh, what's the probability of any person having either this blood type or this other blood type. And it's the use of the or that's fairly critical because that means that uh, you're able to actually sum the probabilities for those two different groups, okay? Because you're using that or statement. So you remember I emphasized this within the classes. So if we actually add together the O group, uh, the A group, the B group, and the AB group, and then we add together the B and the O probabilities, uh, we end up with 0 0.56, which is 56% chance that any randomly person uh, and any randomly chosen person uh, from the American population can actually donate blood to a person with a type B, B blood group. So the distribution of the blood types in India is different. So O has about a 35% composition, there's A has a 27% composition, B has a 26% composition, and AB has a 12% composition. The question therefore is if you choose an American and an Indian from uh, random from the population, uh, what's the probability that both of them will have the O blood type, okay? Um, so what we're essentially saying here is um, uh, we need uh, both of them to have the same categories that we want to pick, so therefore we'll be saying we want the probability of O uh, from an American and O from an Indian, and therefore we need to use the AND statement, which basically means that we can multiply together, we need to multiply together those two different uh, probabilities that we've got. So if we add together the, the Indian data here for the blood group O, A, B, and AB, add it into the memory here, what we're able to do is we're able to take the probability of O for the uh, American population, the probability of O for the Indian population, multiply them together, and what we end up with is 0.1575, which is 15.75%. Okay, so we've got almost a 16% chance that if we picked an individual from each of these two different countries, uh, they would actually both have the O blood group. Okay, so it needs to take into account the probability uh, of, of the share of that blood group from both of those different countries. So here's one final one. So imagine that we have um, a set of um, uh, spam emails that are being sent into our inbox. Uh, thankfully, these days, they're pretty good, the, uh, the anti-spam filters so often it doesn't come straight into our inbox, it goes into our junk. But let's just assume that uh, we, uh, uh, we're actually going to go through that spam folder and uh, look at what all the different uh, uh, types of emails we're trying to advertise. Okay, so we find that about 16% would be financial, about 7% would be health related, 
7% leisure related, 21% focusing on products, 14% uh, focusing on scams, and then uh, the, uh, the, another category would be about 14%, uh, okay? Now, uh, here we have six different areas. We, they don't cover all of the, the different topics, um, but imagine uh, we want to find out what the probability would be that a piece of spam that came through to our email inbox did not concern one of these topics, okay? So what we need to do as a consequence is we basically need to add up all of the probabilities that we've got here and then find the remainder, okay? So if we actually add up all of the ones that we've got here, um, then what we're going to get for all of our probability topics is 0 0.8. So that's basically we've got 81% uh, of the, of the uh, different types of mails coming through to our spam box explained. And then we have basically a, an extra category which we don't account for uh, that falls outside of these different categories that we are interested in quantifying, okay? And obviously, if we uh, basically get the reciprocal, so the, 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 the other portion of the probability that's not explained by the groups that we have here, so we subtract this uh, P topics value from one, we will end up with all of the remaining probability, okay, which is going to be 19%. So if we subtract that here, P something else is 0 0.19, uh, and, that, and that fulfills the question that we've asked, okay. So hopefully now you've understood that we've kind of worked through those three different types of uh, probability question, and that will um, put you in a good stead for actually um, uh, kind of setting up for the assignment where you're going to get a few more of these. Okay, so look, that was kind of the easier part of the previous lecture. We then got into probability distributions and we actually started getting into uh, binomial uh, probability um, uh, distributions and actually using that to understand the probability of uh, irrigation being acquired for um, a specific uh, sites that we might want to, to, to pick uh, in order to grow some, some vegetables. Now, I mentioned in the lectures that we basically need to be aware that we're going to have this function called binom. So in R, that's going to be called the R binom. And basically this binomial distribution then has a set of different usages that we can use, okay? So the R stands there for, for the random part of the binomial distribution, but we also have the density part, probability part, the quantile part, and they all do different things, okay? So if we look um, purely at the density part, this basically returns the probability distribution function. So it says um, what the area of the curve is in relation to um, the, the, the value that you provide. That gives you the probability of a particular event size, for example, happening. Um, uh, the, the, the p value here returns the cumulative distribution function. So this is the probability of an event and all of the events up until that point. Uh, Q represents the inverse of the cumulative distribution function. So given some probability, uh, how many um, events may there be? Uh, and uh, R returns random samples from a binomial distribution, okay? So I understand that's somewhat complicated. Let's actually carry out a couple of, uh, of, of examples and use these different types of distributions uh, because that's going to allow us to kind of understand the kind of nuts and bolts of what we're really doing rather than just talking theoretically like we did in the previous uh, previous lecture. So let's go back to the Mguru et al book, see page 82, where we have that vegetable grower problem um, that's covered. And basically the, the issue is, well, what's the probability a grower can meet the requirement for irrigating only one year out of five years? Because that's the kind of break even viability point for building on that particular site or sorry, um, uh, growing on that particular site. So we know that our n is going to be uh, for five years. Remember here we have the equation, we have the number of trials, which is n. Uh, we have the p, which is the probability. So this is the probability that we might need irrigation in any one year. Um, uh, x is going to be the number of times the given outcome occurs within the n trials. So we're going to iterate over that between zero and five and find out the probabilities. And then we're going to basically do that by giving this density binomial function uh, the uh, x values for that we want to find out the, the probabilities for, uh, the n, which is uh, you know the, the total number of years that we've got, and the p values, the probability value. Okay, so when we do that, what we end up with is sorry, let me just add that. Uh, what we end up is this string of probabilities here. So these are uh, very similar to you, hopefully, because we calculated them 
in the spreadsheet that I gave to you in the last lecture, so you can kind of see how I've done it in Excel, we've done it here now using the binomial function, you've been able to produce the same results, which is nice. Okay, and you can plot them uh, with the probability here on the y-axis and the number of years so that you require irrigation on the x-axis. Okay, so no years here, uh, about 40%. One year's worth of irrigation over five, also about 40%. And then we have a huge drop-off down here because we're unlikely in the current conditions to need a large amount of irrigation over these number of years. Okay, two, three, four, five. Now let's suppose that what we want to do is to know the probability of 0, 1, or 2 uh, years. Uh, so this is the total probability of any of these outcomes occurring. Now, we've got this probability x uh, uh, vector here with all of these probabilities. What we can do is we can add the first one, which represents the 0 year, um, so, so with no irrigation in that year. We can add the second one in the list, which represents only one year of irrigation. And we can add the third one in the list, which represents two years of, of irrigation. Okay, and when we do that, what we end up with this manual calculation is 0 0.968 um, as the probability. So it's 96.8 percent probability um, that uh, the, the the number of uh, irrigation years are going to be two or below, essentially. Okay, and we can actually calculate that. So rather than do it manually, we can use the probability binomial function, and we can just give it uh, the two. Um, uh, uh, year value here, so we're going to say give us the probability up to that outcome 2, and it's going to basically present us with uh, that same value that we calculated manually, okay, so 96.8%. So hopefully that's kind of clear to you that we're able to calculate uh, the cumulative probability doing it manually, or we're just able to give the function uh, the outcome that we want and then learn what the probability would be up to that point in the distribution, okay. So let's calculate the probability of needing irrigation for at least three of the five years. So this is going to be much more costly. Now, basically, what we can do here is we can add um, the probability for no irrigation, for one year's worth of irrigation, for two years' worth of irrigation, uh, and then for three years' worth of irrigation. So that gets us the probability for uh, irrigation all the way up to the year, all the way up to, to three years, and then we're able to sum them and then subtract it from one, and then the remainder, remainder would be the remainder would be uh, the, the value that we're particularly looking for. So we get 0 0.997 being um, the probability of b below three, essentially. Um, uh, and then what we end up with for the actual answer here is uh, is a much smaller number, and that's uh, um, for, for three or more. So I think um, zero, one, two, three. Sorry, this isn't at least three. It's four, uh, four, more than three of the five years. Okay, so that's how we get that particular number. We can actually use the cumulative distribution function. So if we look at x and we get the fourth value here. And um, we're going to get the year three, and we're going to basically give it to that inbuilt function that we have, and we're going to say subtract that outcome, which again is 0 0.997, so 99.7%, from that uh, total number of probabilities that we have, which is one. So when we do that, we get 0 0.0028. Okay. And you can also just do this using the probability density function for the binomial. You can give it the, the, the value that you want, which is the year three. And then basically you can alter this lower tail uh, being false or true. So here what we're doing is we're replicating uh, that value that we generated above. But what we're saying is give us that value, um, but, but provide it in the lower tail. Okay. Um, you could say you could get it in the in the higher tail and it would provide you with the 0 0.997 value, or you could say you could have it in the lower tail, the probability of that uh, occurring in the lower tail, and you get the 0 0.002 value. Okay, so hopefully that's uh, going to give you a little bit of code to play around with in order to understand. Now there's another example within your book which focuses on um, this uh, uh, idea that there's an expected number of days of snowfall or heavy snowfall in Flagstaff, Arizona. And if you look at page 87, it'll provide you with a little bit of detail about this uh, particular case. And really what the question is going to be is, well, how many heavy snowfall days are actually likely to take place 
um, uh, for that particular, uh, for any particular year, okay, given the data that we have. So um, what we're interested in doing is finding the frequency of occurrence of events up to six heavy uh, snowfall days. Uh, and essentially what we're going to do then is we're going to use our existing knowledge of the mean number of heavy snowfall days per winter, which is 1.8. Okay, so we allocate to lambda uh, 1.8. Um, and then essentially what we're going to end up doing then is a little bit of uh, the calculation of the, 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 the equation that I showed within the previous lecture. Okay, so here's the equation. What we do need to do, obviously, is to get the, um, the natural logarithm value. Okay, so remember that the natural logarithm of x is the power to which e would have to be raised to equal x. So we can do this using the exponential function. So if we raise, um, so, so, if, so if we use the exponential function here for 2, we get 7.38. Uh, if we do it here for 1, we get 2.78. And we can do it for the lambda value as well, uh, which is 6.04. And uh, that, that basically indicates that, uh, so, so, so the Euler's number so is 2.71828, which basically means uh, that E is raised to the power of 1.8, and that gives us 6.04965, okay? Uh, so if we were to go x 1.8, uh, this would give us the, the value that, that we would expect. Uh, just the same as if we were to go uh, back to some of these other values that we pressed before, um, we would end up getting um, a similar outcomes. Uh, so look, that provides us with all the nuts and bolts basically to put this together. Okay, so we've got the lambda value that was the mean frequency of uh, the number of heavy snowfall days, which we can raise to the power of x. And we get a set outcome for the numerators of the equation there, and then we can divide it by uh, the exponential of lambda multiplied by the factorial of x. And when we do that, we end up with these probabilities, which are basically going to be indicative of 16% uh, uh, chance of there being only one heavy day per season, 29% uh, chance of there being two heavy days, 26% uh, uh, chance of there being three heavy days, and so on and so forth. Uh, through this uh, particular example, okay. Um, so the built-in functions are just like the ones that we showed before. So if you need to calculate the density or the probability or use a quantile, uh, then this will provide you with all of the understanding that you need in order to kind of rejig uh, the particular function that's here in order to, to give you the answer necessary. So the format of the function is, uh, as you see here, it takes the, uh, the x value x being the frequency of occurrence and the lambda value being that uh, that mean frequency uh, uh, of um, sorry the lambda value being the uh, the mean frequency of the event um, and that should yield um, essentially what we calculated previously um, using the kind of uh, the, the manual approach so um, here we did it um, just calculating to those factors ourselves uh, but here we're able to literally reproduce uh, those particular outcomes using the uh, the inbuilt function that uh, we'd used previously for the binomial distribution, and here we're using for the Poisson distribution. Okay, let's work with a few of these examples. So um, for the Poisson distribution, uh, let's think about this problem. The number of arrivals to a particular state park is uh, found to be Poisson distributed, and we found that we, we have a mean of 2.5 camping groups arriving per day. So the question, therefore, is on a, a particular day during that summer, what's the probability that we might have no groups actually arriving at the park? Okay, So what we're going to do is we're going to give um, the, uh, uh, the, the value 0 here for the uh, the uh, frequency of occurrence of the event, and we're going to give it the mean uh, that we have. So this is going to be the, the lambda value, the mean frequency of the event. And when we do that, we end up with a probability of about 0 0.08, which is 8.2%, okay? So we've got an 8% probability uh, that we might have no groups arriving on uh, any one day in the park. We also then have uh, the opportunity to ask the question, well, what's the probability that between one and three groups might arrive? Uh, so in this case, we could have uh, uh, x values which include one, two, and three. So we want to concatenate them together and provide that concatenated vector to the function and then provide it with the mean occurrence here. And it should spit out the probabilities for each of those different outcomes. So 20% outcome for one group, 
uh, probability outcome, a 25% chance of two groups and a 21% uh, probability for three groups. But we don't just want the individual probabilities, we need the sum of all because we're interested in P or uh, so the probability of one or two or three, okay, which means that we can basically sum them all up, thankfully. So what we can do is we can take the the outcome of uh, that particular function that's being returned, so these three numbers down here, and then we can sum them using the sum function, and that's going to provide us with 0.67 here. So that's the probability that uh, we've essentially got um, between one and three groups uh, actually arriving. Okay, so it's a 67% chance that we'll have between uh, those allocated numbers. Okay, look, that gives you an example now for the Poisson distribution. So we've covered two of those main types. And now let's kind of finish up by just focusing on the final type, so the Gaussian distribution, uh, the normal distribution, the bell-shaped curve. And the formula for calculation is somewhat different, so we, we're not going to use it here. We're going to instead use a standard uh, normal table, uh, which means that we have to convert our distribution to one where the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. And I think I uh, somewhat glossed over that in the, in the previous lecture, but basically uh, that's what we uh, were referring to when we spoke up here about mu being zero and sigma being one in this equation, okay? And the point of that is that then we've got this, uh, you know, this standardized understanding of the distribution. Uh, then we can use the standard normal table um, uh, in order for us to um, uh, basically obtain a z-score, which is what we, we covered within the lecture. Uh, so obviously the z-score is um, our ability to um, uh, estimate the number of standard deviations away from the mean, away from the mean a particular value may be, and that provides us with an understanding of its, of its distribution within the whole probability space. Again, we can use that to our advantage. So to get that z-score, what we need is basically a particular value of interest for x, and then we need to subtract the mean value and then divide it by the standard deviation. Okay. Now the trick to z-scores is that uh, we need a table of reference. So um, uh, this can also be referred to as the standard normal table. But it helps us basically find the area, so the probability that corresponds to a specific z-score. Okay. So we can go to uh, ztable.com, for example, and we can um, uh, go in here and look at how we actually use uh, z-scores. So we, first of all, we need to convert to a z-score, uh, which I've already explained in the lecture, so that should be fairly clear to you. And then basically you need to read through here and understand how we then begin to access into uh, th this table of values in order to get a, a probability um, in order to get a number which represents the probability for, for the distribution uh, density, okay? So essentially, when I talk about, uh, I think I said it before, um, find the area corresponding to a specific z-score, you can see here that we have this value, this specific z-score, 1.09, and the area underneath it uh, is 86.21, so it's 86.21% of the values fall below this, and that provides us with an understanding, therefore, uh, of, of the likelihood of certain values being over or above uh, this particular um, z-score that we might have uh, obtained. So you can look in the book uh, at page 95, where we have a 40-year annual precipitation record for DC, and we basically want to make certain probability estimates for certain precipitation outcomes. Okay, so what's the probability of annual precipitation actually uh, exceeding uh, 48 inches a year? So first what we need to do is we need to say, uh, okay, let's find the mean value. So the X bar is going to be 39.95 inches. We then need to find the actual, uh, so we need to provide the value that we're interested in, which is the 48 inches uh, value, because that's what we're interested in exceeding. So we set that as our XI value, uh, the X value. And then we, we, we know the standard deviation, which is 7.5 inches. Okay, so that's the average deviation around the mean. So we need to allocate that into the memory. And then basically what we'll do is we will subtract the mean from our x value and divide it by the standard deviation. And when we do that, we end up with a, uh, a z-score of 1.073333. Okay, so 48 
inches is 1.07 standard deviations above the mean, okay? And we know that it's above the mean because the actual uh, uh, the z-score that we obtain is positive, okay? And if it was negative, then it would indicate that it would be below the mean, okay? Now we can look up the corresponding probability to the z-score in a z-table, okay? So if we go to ztable.com, we're able to use this here, so you need to read this and understand it to find uh, the values uh, relating to the, the, the actual z-score that we've got, okay? So uh, the z-table is different depending on which direction you're interested in the values, so whether you're focusing on above the mean or below the mean, and whether the values represent either just part of the distribution like they do in your textbook, or whether they actually represent all of the distribution as they do here on the z-table website. Okay, so you just need to be aware of these two differences. So if you go into the back of the book that you've got, the McGrew et al. book, you'll be able to find the z-score table in the back there. And what you can do is you can um, look across the, the z-table. So let me just give you an example here. Let me go back to the one that we had before. So basically, when you're looking at these, what you need to do is, if you have a, a z-score of, say, 1.07, you need to go down this axis here until you find 1, like we have here. And then you need to go across until you find the other digit, which is here, which is uh, 0 0.07. And you get an 85.77% um, uh, value, which represents 85% of the values beneath this point, okay? That's basically how you need to read uh, these tables. If you go into the back of the book, you're going to get a different value, and that's uh, th uh, 30, uh, 0.3577, and that's because the back of the book only represents uh, the distance above the mean, uh, okay? So, so not the entire distribution. You're only getting the portion uh, of the of the value uh, between where your value is and the actual mean, all right? So you need to still do a little bit of extra work in order to get uh, that value that you're interested in, okay? So be aware that there are these differences here and that you need to work out how to kind of get the final probability. So here what we need to do if we've got a 0.3577 value is we need to subtract uh, uh, 0.5 from it in order to get the final probability, okay? So uh, I think before what we had uh, was, uh, was it 0.8577? Uh, so essentially what we're, what we're getting here is the reciprocal uh, of what we've got here, okay? So uh, this value here is representing the values below, uh, and this here is representing the values above. And obviously that's because what we were interested in doing is finding uh, the, 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 the likelihood of annual precipitation exceeding that 48 inches level, okay? So look, you, you can go into the Z table example as well here and you can basically patch the digits in and you end up with uh, those values that I just mentioned before. Uh, and hopefully this provides you with you know, two different ways for you to actually look up these different values. So you can do it in the back of the McGrew book, just between the mean and the value that you've got, or you can do it on the Z-Table website, which will represent the full part of the distribution beneath that point that you've got, okay? So you need to just be aware of that and uh, don't get caught up in it because when you do your homework, you're going to need to make sure that you, your assignments, that you get the, the correct probability value. So the form of the function that we're interested in here is uh, the, the p-norm function. So this is basically just the normal function as we uh, approached it before with the other R functions. But here we've got the density, the probability, the quantile, and uh, also the random um, elements from the normal distribution. And you can use them in very similar ways, okay? So here if we basically say that we've got an xi value of 1.0733, it's going to present that 0 0.85 value, and we can subtract that from 1, and we get the 0 0.14 um, percent that we uh, we already calculated up here uh, in these previous uh, in these previous examples. Okay. Now suppose the the question was actually uh, not what probability, but what is the number that goes with that amount of the probability. Uh, well, in effect, what we need to do here is kind of reverse the process. So we give the probability and we find the z-score, and, and that's very much possible with the q uh, norm function. Okay, so if you're basically going to give it um, a, a quintile, uh, and then it's going to return to you the probability of that. Okay, so 
think of this value p that we're going to give it as the point at which 90% of the values fall uh, above in this case because this is only 0.1. Okay, so when we do that, p is 0.1, we're then going to give it to this q norm function. It's going to say that um, for that 0.1 value, um, that, that's going to be minus 1.28 standard deviations below the mean, okay? So from minus 1.28 standard deviations, all of that distribution uh, above that point is going to be 90% of the total uh, values. And then the, the points that, that fall below that are going to be the 10% of remaining values, okay? So it's kind of a really nice way for you to slice into these distributions to, um, to get probabilities and understand uh, how large and what the, the outcome, what the frequency may be for future events based on different sized, uh, um, uh, uh, for, for example, threats, if we're thinking about flooding or storms or things like this, or it could just be, you know, what the number may be uh, for a random toss of a dice, okay. So we have the z-score, um, but what does that tell us about the amount of precipitation? Well, we can go back to the equation uh, that we, uh, we we used previously. We can derive the z-score and basically substitute the values uh, with the ones that we have so that we're able to solve for the xi value. Okay, so we're moving the xi value to the right. What we've done here is we've got the, the uh, x-bar uh, mean value we're going to add, the z-score multiplied by the standard deviation. So this gives you the additional part um, this value here, sorry. This gives you the additional part that you need to add to the mean in order to get that value. And obviously this is minus 9.611. Uh, one, one. The mean is 39. Uh, so when we then we subtract that value uh, from the mean, we get 30.33, which means that 10% of the values below 30.33 and 90% of the values are above 30.33. Okay. So that gives us some indication of, uh, of, of you know, the probability of different sized amounts of precipitation taking place. Okay, look, that kind of covered the distributions and the trick for the homework is going to basically be to look at the type of question, think about the different uh, distribution types that you might need to use and then actually apply them uh, and make an estimate for the probabilities within the assignment, okay? Now, um, Reach out to me if you need a little bit of help with that. I'm around, I'm able to help you. I understand this is more, uh, it's one of the more tricky weeks that we have. Um, so I'm just gonna close off here just by thinking a little bit about some of the more general properties of distributions. And one way to do that is by using kind of nifty computer trick called loops. So some functions uh, use loops behind the scenes in R when dealing with vectors. So they're able to do things on, on uh, vectors and numbers, for example, and produce answers. So if we call the standard deviation or the sum, R will loop through all of the numbers that's in our vector, okay, in order to produce that single outcome. So here we're concatenating the values one, two, three, four, five, and creating a vector out of it called new. Let me just clear the, the global environment. So we've got this new uh, vector here of one to five, and we're able to get the standard deviation, which is 1.58, or we're also able to get the summation, which is 15. So the standard deviation, the sum automatically loop through every value in the vector, okay? And we're able to kind of show that sequentially. So let's try this using um, a summation of zero. So we're starting at the zero point, and what we're going to do is we're going to loop through um, so for every uh, n value in the sequence of 1 to 5, um, add n to the summation and then print it, okay? So what we're going to end up having for 1 to 5 is it's going to say, well, um, 1 plus 1 is 1, so that's what it's printed. 1 plus 2 is 3, so that's what it's printed here. And then, uh, and obviously I've written it down here so you can see it more clearly. Uh, 3 plus 3 is 6, and 6 plus 4 is 10. And therefore we're able to kind of iterate through these different loops each time, holding on to that summation uh, um, uh, variable, which has a certain uh, number associated with it. And in each loop uh, that it does of this function, it adds that additional sequential number onto it, okay? So it's a really nice little technique once you've got this uh, loop function set up to, to do a variety of different things. And you could use you know, Monte Carlo, like I explained in the lecture, to do this type of thing. It's maybe if you move on to kind of more advanced master's work or a PhD, you'll be looking at these type of probabilistic methods. 
So let's look again at how binomial distribution changes with size n. So we're going to plot the multiple lines on a single uh, graph. So n is the number of trials that we have, or in the case here, uh, we've actually used years. Okay, so we've got five years. Uh, X is um, going to be um, uh, the potential um, uh, outcome. And we've got the probability of 0 0.1. And then LTY and PCH are setting the line and the point types. Okay, so we're just going to iterate over those um, each time that we run. So they get different, um, uh, they get a different, uh, uh, a very clearly different line and, and a point type. So look, we've got the density for the binomial distribution. We can give it the x, um, uh, uh, the set of uh, x uh, quantiles here, and we can give it the n, which is the, the total number of uh, observations. Um, and um, basically what we're able to do is to get those bins um, that we're going, going to then plot, okay? Uh, let me just uh, run this. There we go. So you can see that what we end up with is a probability for each of these different years, and it gets very small as we get further on down. And we're able to plot a line for this as well. Um, and the key point here is that we've got a very small number of, of years, uh, but actually if we add um, uh, more years to our sample, so what we're going to do is we're going to cycle through, we're going to increase the sample size for more and more years, all the way up to 100. Essentially what we get when we loop through is uh, a much uh, we, we get a much uh, more standardized shape for that distribution. Okay, so if we, I'll just add the legend on here as well, so you can clearly see what we're working with. Um, these are all the different years here, and you can see the probability up here. And if we start, so this is going to be where we have very small sample size over here of n, and we don't really have much of a distribution or shape that we're familiar with here. But as we start to basically increase uh, the number of years, um, that, so the number of iterations uh, that we have, so the number of um, uh, so the sample size, uh, then what we end up with is a much nicer kind of uh, a more uh, it looks like a much normally a much more normally distributed shape essentially. Um, because we've increased the actual uh, size of, of the underlying data. Okay, look, so this is closing this lecture to, to a close now. Um, the, the key point is basically trying to work with those different distributional functions and kind of linking that into the content uh, that's been provided in the lecture. So you've got that for the binomial distribution, uh, the Poisson distribution, uh, and the normal distribution. And the trick's going to be working out which function you need to use in order to uh, actually get the, the, the values uh, that, that you need to do for the different assignment components, okay? So don't hesitate to reach out to me if you've got any further questions. Um, I expect that uh, it will be kind of tricky for you to understand the use of the Z tables, so make sure you read both the website that I provided and the actual textbook in order to kind of understand that. Uh, and there's lots of materials available online if you need a little bit of extra help, okay? So thanks for tuning in to the fourth laboratory session for GGS 300, and uh, I look forward to seeing you all soon. So have a nice day, and uh, I look forward to hearing you in the next week. Thank you. Goodbye.